I'm going to take you on a virtual tour around the Titanic. Um, before her crash, of course. Let's see together just what kind of a luxury vessel it was. First of all, of course, just look at the size of her. The Titanic was one of the biggest ocean liners of her time, rivaled only by her sister ships, Olympic and Britannic. Even by today's standards, she's quite impressive. But let's not stay outside for too long and proceed on board. We climb up to the B deck, where most of the first-class passengers entered the ship. It was the second-highest deck. The gangways were on the port, a uh, left side, but entrances mirrored each other on both sides. We find ourselves in a foyer with three doors. The one on our right opens on a private promenade, from which VIP passengers could enjoy the ocean view with the comfort of lounge chairs, all on our own. And the two doors in the front lead to the grand staircase. The view immediately stunned everyone, and no surprise here, the staircase was the pride and glory of the Titanic. This magnificence was made of oak and wrought iron, decorated with intricate patterns, all made by hand. Its centerpiece was simply mesmerizing, a masterful wooden carving with a clock in it. And above, there was a beautiful glass dome meant to create an illusion of daylight. The stairs led to other decks. But if you didn't feel like walking, you could go around a bit for the three elevators. They would take you to decks from A to E. Those were reserved for the first and second class passengers, while the third class had most of the F deck and part of G deck for themselves. The four doors in the corners of the stairway hall led to the passenger cabins. Surprisingly, the corridors were pretty narrow, and people almost had to squeeze as if they met each other on their way to or from their rooms. Only two persons could go abreast in there. Let's turn to the right from the entrance and walk down one of the corridors. There's something I want to show you. First of all, on the right is the entrance to the huge suite consisting of three connected cabins. This is where the notorious Joseph Bruce Ismay lived, the chairman of White Star Line that owned the ship. B-52 was a sitting room where he received guests and talked business. B-54 and B-56 were two bedrooms, with a bathroom between them. Further down the corridor on both left and right resided other distinguished passengers, including Benjamin Guggenheim in B-82. You might remember him from the 1997 movie. And when we get to the end of the hallway, look to your left. Familiar, isn't it? Yep, Titanic had not one, but two grand staircases. One in the forecastle, which we saw earlier, and one in the aft. Now, on our left is a reception room, where passengers could wait in comfort before the restaurant's door is opened, and behind the door, right there, is Café Parisien. Decorated with live vines and having big windows, it was designed for first- and second-class passengers to have refreshment while enjoying the wonderful views. It was one of the many innovations on the luxury ocean liner. Right next to the cafe was the restaurant where the wealthier passengers had their meals. There were 138 seats overall, and passengers could book them in advance. The menu hung right before the entrance, and guests were also accommodated with coat hangers and hat hooks so they could leave their outerwear in a recess outside the main dining hall. Each table was decorated with a vase of live flowers, and waiters were always at the ready when the guests came in. On the other side of the restaurant were the doors to the entrance landing for second-class passengers. From there, you could get to the second-class bar, lavatories, and a big smoke room, as well as a large promenade. Let's not go far from the entrance landing, though. From here, we'll follow one deck up to the A deck reserved exclusively for first-class passengers. The deck is divided into three main parts. The one we're in right now is the Veranda Café and Palm Court. Similar accommodations were made on both the Titanic sister ships, but unlike them, this one had a roof that protected guests from the elements, so they could relax and have some refreshments in any weather. Live potted plants stood everywhere, creating a peaceful and elegant atmosphere. Behind the double sliding doors was the first-class promenade deck, the largest one on the whole ship. At its widest, 
the deck could easily accommodate 10 people walking abreast. It ringed the whole A-deck, and small alcoves were used to store deck chairs that passengers could rent and lounge in. Following the deck to the forecastle, we come across the first-class smoke room, a huge hall meant for having talks and relaxing. Further ahead was, of course, the grand staircase. Let's go there. By the way, directly to the right of the stairs, you can see a cabin entrance. Here, Francis Brown lived, whom we have to thank for many photos of the Titanic and her passengers before its crash. He left her in Queenstown, Ireland, and later sold his pictures to newspapers around the world. Finally, closer yet to the bow of the ship was the lounge styled after the Versailles in France, which connected with the reading and writing room on the other end. The lounge was indeed a magnificent place where the richest of passengers spent their time in talks or contemplation. Let's follow down the corridor to the forecastle grand stairway again and go two decks down. There's something interesting there too. Here we are on the sea deck. Let's save us several minutes of walking and skip the whole mid part of the ship to the second grand stairway. On the right, there was the first class barber shop. The barber, Augustus Weichmann, stayed with the ship during the disaster, but was fortunately rescued later. And on the left was Maids and Valet Saloon, where servants of the first-class passengers had their meals. In stark contrast to the passenger facilities, it was really simple, with long tables accommodating up to 8 people and no decorations whatsoever. Hey, since we've started skipping already, why not do it again? Here we go! We've teleported to the D-Deck, almost right beneath where we were standing just a few moments ago. It's the first-class dining saloon, the largest meal area for the first-class passengers. It accommodated over 500 guests seated at round tables. Perhaps the most distinguishing feature here were the decorative colonnades dividing the hall in three parts and the faux windows that covered the deck portholes, creating a pleasant impression. Second-class dining saloon was also on the D-Deck, but closer to the stern. Let's go there. It was only slightly less posh than the first-class saloon, with long tables placed closer to each other, but the mahogany pillars and furniture along with white ceiling and soft lighting made the place look spacious. The saloon could seat all second-class passengers on board at once. Now, let's divert a little and make a bit of comparison. Here's what the third-class dining room looked like. Located in the middle of F-deck, it was a very plain-looking hall divided into four sections. Long, simple tables could seat up to 22 people. Light fixtures on the ceiling were just enough to make quite dim illumination. Coat hangers were fixed along the bare whitewashed walls, and no attempt was made to beautify the portholes. From here, though, like third-class passengers and the crew, we can get upstairs to a very peculiar place – the Scotland Road. It was a long corridor on the left side of the Titanic and it ran across the whole length of the ship on the E-deck, giving quick access to many of her areas for third-class passengers and especially the crew. The corridor was named after the major road in Liverpool, from which many of the crew members hailed. When the ship started sinking, the Scotland Road flooded among the first, and it was the main reason why the Titanic listed to the left. Eventually, it broke into two when the ship cracked. On the topic of the ship's crew areas, Let's travel to the reciprocating engine room on the Orlop deck. Behold the mighty engines of the Titanic! This room was by far the largest on the ship, accommodating two engines, either of them four stories tall. Boiler rooms provided them with steam on which they ran, and their shafts ran all the way up to the foremost boat deck. Let's go there for the view now, shall we? The main attraction of the boat deck, apart from the bridge, was the gymnasium. Here, first-class passengers and their children could exercise and generally have fun. For an ocean liner of the time, it was the most striking innovation. Among the most popular exercise machines was the electric camel. You could sit on top of it, trying to stay in the saddle while the device walked, imitating a camel. During the Titanic's last hours, lots of passengers gathered in the gymnasium, waiting to board the lifeboats. Ok, now let's go outside to the first-class promenade and just enjoy the outstanding view of the ocean. It's beautiful here, isn't it? I don't even want to go back to reality now, but ah oh well. Time to do something else. It was nice talking to you though. See you next time!